Hi, welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly talk show and which works to educate the public about non-theism. That's atheists and agnostics and freethinkers, and to protect the constitutional principle of the separation between state and church. Please join us in our vital work, or you can contact us to ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at ffrf.org. We have a special show this week featuring an individual who thought his way out of a notorious family cult, one you have heard of, the Westboro Baptist Church, founded by his late father, Fred Phelps, in Topeka, Kansas. The Westboro Baptist Church is known for its outrageous and inflammatory slogans, obsessive anti-gay views, and picketing of funerals. The Southern Poverty Law Center classifies the Westboro Baptist Church as a hate group. Four of Fred Phelps' 13 children are now estranged from the family, and they include Nathan Phelps, who's our guest today. Nate Phelps, who in 2020 received a $10,000 Henry Zumack Freedom from Religious Fundamentalism Award from the Freedom from Religion Foundation. He's here with us today to talk about what it was like to grow up in this church and in this family and how and why he was able to break away. You're going to hear some pretty shocking stories. You're also going to hear about how he came to embrace free thought despite his upbringing. So thank you so much, Nate, for joining us today on Free Thought Matters. Thanks for having me here, guys. And I understand you're there in uh, British Columbia, beautiful British Columbia. Yeah, and I'm in the southeast corner of British Columbia in the East Kootenays, where the Rockies are up here. Very beautiful. So, so, to, so we met you a few times, Nate, uh, and, and today we know you're an outspoken and happy atheist, but you were born into one of the most notorious Christian churches in North America. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like in your youth and your upbringing and, and all the, what kind of things did your dad and your church teach you? My father was a, uh, he called himself a primitive Baptist. He uh, preached the tenets of Calvinism. He was an extremist. I tend to call him a hyper-Calvinist because he took those ideas from Calvin and kind of turned left and never looked back. Um, it was a, uh, it was a very restrictive authoritarian environment. Um, he was, uh, he made it clear that he was the absolute head, even though he had a body of uh, elders, so to speak. He basically did what he wanted to do. And uh, he, he, one of the tenets of that, uh, of that uh, type of faith was that uh, women were inferior to men. So he uh, ruled with that idea. Hmm. He, was, uh, he, he wasn't afraid to use physical violence as one of the tools to make sure that people stayed in line and, and uh, adhered to his policy. So uh, it was a violent environment. It was a, both physically and uh, psychologically. Of course, we didn't know that growing up as kids. To us, it was normal. Um, and that's sad. That's very sad to hear that you would yeah, I, not know that. I think, I think that's an important point that people need to understand when, they, when they're talking about or, 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 or viewing um, cults on, you know, in, in the um, public arena, especially in this time, watching what's going on with this uh, Trump situation, that uh, a lot of times, especially for young, young children, uh, if they're in an insular environment, they don't have any capacity or even desire to look outside that and consider the possibility that what they're learning is um, is false or that there are other ideas out there that are just as valid. So um, I like to point that out, yeah. Do you think your, your mother really wanted to have 13 children? That's a hard one to answer. Actually, she ended up, she had 16 pregnancies wow. pretty much right in a row. So she was pregnant for the better part of of two decades, three were, were stillborn. Um, 
but again, that was one of those things where the Bible, in my, in my father's interpretation of it, the Bible was explicit that blessed was the man who had his quiver full of them. Uh, quiver? That, uh, quiver, is that the word? Yeah, quiver full of, you know, it was like, a, like arrows. An analogy. Yeah. Arrows, yeah. It's a good question. I don't know if, if, she had, if she had had the freedom to make those choices herself, would she have chosen to have 13 kids? I don't know. Which one were you? Were you one of the first or middle? I was I was sixth. I have uh, uh, two brothers and three sisters who are older than me, and then uh, seven younger. Uh, wow! So you were kind of maybe being in the middle was a good place there. Uh, 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 you mentioned so, yeah. that your father started off as a, a primitive Baptist, and I wanted to make sure that viewers know that when I first heard that term primitive Baptist, I thought it was a description, but no, it, it's an actual church denomination. And yeah. and then he, and then he veered really right. Um, did did he establish the Westboro Baptist Church? I I believe in 1955. Is that right? Yeah, he had uh, just a little bit of backstory. He'd gone to Bob Jones University, and then interestingly uh -huh. enough, he ended up coming up to Canada, spent a couple of semesters in uh, at Three Hills College in uh, just north of about an hour north of Calgary. And those were, were both very fundamentalist type uh, organizations. And then he ended up down in Pasadena, California at a college there. And he started preaching, you know, just soapbox preaching uh, on the campus of that, of that college and got so much attention, negative attention, as well as positive, I guess, from people who were, were agreeing with what he had to say. So he got kicked off of the campus as far as his preaching activities. So he stood just across the street from the campus and uh, that activity ended up getting him because because the uh, the uh, college was challenging him. It got the attention of uh, Time Magazine, so they did an article about him, and suddenly he was the the golden boy of the hmm. fundamentalist Christian community in America. So he started going around to various places across the country where he was invited to speak, and one of those was uh, Topeka. Uh, he was invited by a, a gentleman named Leaford Cabin, who was running the East Side Baptist Church there in Topeka. And uh, so he moved his uh, wife. And at that time, I think he had just our oldest uh, uh, boy. And um, they moved to Topeka. And he was there as kind of a guest preacher. And that developed into an offer for him to uh, seed and run the church that they wanted to open on the west side of town. And that was the beginning of Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, within, I'd say, six months, uh, he had uh, done so much damage that people who had transferred over to that church left. And he was left basically with an empty church preaching to his family. Well, he filled it with his and, large family. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, no, wonder, and, no wonder he had 13 right. kids. He can fill the pews. So, so Nate, right. um, so you were born what year? I was born in 1958. 1958. So you were really there almost from the beginning. You grew up in the Westboro Baptist Church in the shadow of your father. And I know things kind of escalated over the years, but when you were like in grade school, what was a typical day like or typical week like in your family? Well, interestingly enough, I can't recall in the early years that there was a, a tremendous amount of attention to the preaching and prayer and, and the kind of things that we see, see my family doing today. We were at church uh, twice every Sunday. There was no negotiating that from, from the time we came home from the hospital when we were born. Um, he saw that as a, uh, a necessary uh, activity that we would be in church twice on Sunday. He would preach for two or three hours. and uh, But then it seemed to me that outside of of that environment, life felt a little bit normal, but there were things like when Christmas time came, he didn't believe that the Bible taught uh, that we were to celebrate the birth of Christ, so uh, we didn't engage in any of that, activ that activity, and that was the first time I saw him actually uh, confront um, outsiders and impose his beliefs and insist that, that what he wanted happen happened. So when we were in... Uh, in grade school, when they were doing any kind of activity that had to do with uh, with Christmas, then we were excused from the classroom and had to go down and sit in the library until that was over. 
So he was already starting some some of that kind of activity. He had confrontations with neighbors, and he had, again, I wasn't aware of this personally because I was too young, but he had decided that he was going to go to law school after he represented himself in a case um, where a neighbor pursued him because he had shot their their dog oh, who'd dear. come onto our property. Wow. So he won that, and he fancied himself uh, effective at that kind of uh, activity. So he went to law school, and he, quite frankly, he was very effective at that. He ended up graduating from Washburn Law School there in Topeka, at the top of his class. He ran the moot court there, and so he'd gotten involved in, in law. And then somewhere again, when I was still too young, uh, to know what was going on, he'd gotten in trouble with the uh, ethics board and was disbarred or suspended from practicing law for a couple of years. So and that's when I really remember Go ahead. when things started changing. He started becoming more focused on uh, speaking about this is God's church and we're being attacked. Mm -hmm. um, he started uh, isolating the family more from the outside world and... Uh, and then a lot of the other things that happened that were so uh, informative in my childhood uh, so basically Nate, flowed from that. Nate, I remember hearing you speak about and reading um, uh, articles that have, you've written about the nasty turn that your family took. At one point with him, he became really extremely abusive. Was that when you were in junior high school, middle school? Well, it, it was as long as I can remember as a child. It, I mean... And, you know, when we were younger, he used a, a barber strap and when the kids were uh, uh, had done something they shouldn't have. And, and he would he used that, that thing so often that the ends of it frayed. So when he was beating the children, the the strips at the end would wrap around and rip the skin on the side of the kids' ah. um, hips. Um, and then that thing got worn down so much that he one day called us all together and announced that he was going to use... Uh, going forward, he was going to use a Maddox handle. Um, a Maddox, I don't know if you know what that is. It's a, a farming tool. You can One end is, is an axe, the other end is a hoe. Oh. And, uh, the handle on it is probably about three and a half feet long, and, and the base of it is about, um, I'd say, a six-inch, seven-inch uh, circumference. And he would swing that thing like a baseball bat when he was beating the kids. Yeah. Frightening. It must have been frightening. So, Nate, we have to take a break. Sorry to interrupt you there. And I heard your dog barking. Don't shoot the dog. <laughs> let, let the dog live. Uh, we're going to take a break. And, uh, we'll come, come back and hear some more about what happened as you were growing up in and, the Westboro Baptist and Church. And then why you changed your and mind. And why you left. And why you left. So we'll be right back with more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hinahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good, and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experience as being an atheist through my life, I've found that um, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on uh, my interactions with other people and that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org.
Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you on the web. Welcome back to Free That Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Nate Phelps, the son of the notorious Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church. Who uh, you know? You know, in my in my mind, Nate, our images of these angry anti-gay picketers. In fact, they picketed one of our meetings once uh, in D.C. And your family also showed up to picket a debate I was doing uh, in Kansas. But uh, you left the family and you left the church before that kind of notorious anti-gay stuff happened. Is is that true? And, and then why did you leave? Well. Um, we talked briefly about some of the violence there, and there was also, um, at one point, he went through a process where he ended up in the hospital sick, so he went on a health kick and then imposed that on his, his family, and um, so there was a lot of violence. If, if there wasn't success in losing weight and getting our bodies in shape, because, as the Bible says, we're a temple. So going into uh, junior high, high school, I was... Uh, constantly in a position of being uh, beaten and, and uh, having violence imposed on me. And I just got to the point where I, I accepted uh, my father's description of who I was and, and uh, what my relationship was going to be with God. So um, when I was about 16 and a half, one of my older brothers actually managed to leave in spite of my father's uh, efforts to uh, keep all of his family intact. So I started making plans, and uh, as my 18th birthday approached, I knew I had to wait till I was 18 because he made it clear that he had control over us uh, legally. And then on the, so I bought an old car and had it hidden and uh, slowly packed my, my few belongings and hid them in the garage. And then on the night of my 18th birthday, after everyone was asleep, I went and got the car and backed it into the, the driveway and filled it up with my, my uh, few things and uh, went back in the house and, and stood and watched the clock in, in the dining room uh, tick up to midnight and then I left. Uh -huh. But I, I didn't leave at that point. I didn't leave believing that my father was wrong with his religion. I left because I thought uh, he was right and that um, he, he believed God was going to, or Christ was going to return by around the year 2000. So I had done the math and I figured, okay, I've got another 20 some years. I'm going to live my life on my terms yeah. away from the violence. It was safer. And, uh, but I believed, I sincerely believe when I left that I was going to die somewhere around the year 2000, that I was going to go to hell. That's wow. just the way it was. Wow. That, that's really poignant. So, uh, I know that I think you, what did you stay in um, Kansas for a while, or did you? I know you ended up on the West Coast. Yeah, I, I spent. Um, let's see, I left in '76, and spent some time in uh, Kansas City and uh, St. Louis, and then eventually in 1981 moved to Southern California, and was there for about 25 years. Uh, my my um, trajectory as far as religion was. At first, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I was terrified of it. Um, but after about five years, I started exploring the possibility that uh, the God of my father wasn't the true God. So I started going to more uh, um, mainstream churches. I got married in 1986. And uh, because one of my most fervent desires was that my kids would not be isolated and ostracized from the, the community at large, I thought it was important to include religion um, as a social activity. So we joined an evangelical free church there in Southern California. And my kids were raised uh, early on uh, in that environment. We made a lot of good friends. Um, but I had an experience. In, and during all of that, I, I continued to ask questions to myself and to those who I thought it was safe to ask questions to. Um, and I just wasn't satisfied. I was immersed deeply in that, uh, that Calvary Chapel system there in, in Orange County, California, and listened, you know, constantly on talk radio to people like uh, 
focus on the family and Greg mm-hmm. Laurie and uh, John MacArthur. And um, in that process, I also had, had gotten into counseling, first with a, a counselor that had a degree in theology who helped me um, work through some of those questions that I had about my father's interpretation of the Bible. And then I went to a, a more secular counselor at one point. So in all that process, I started uh, asking questions and I started uh, considering it more uh, diligently for myself. You know, what did I think the truth was? And uh, was asking some what I consider to be some some leaders in um, Christianity at that time. And it came away with I was I was really quite, quite surprised at how simplistic um, the responses were that I got. And, you know, basically, you just have to have faith and you have to believe that God loves you and that, and that type of thing. And then when my oldest boy was about five or six, we were uh, we were coming home from from uh, some outing and I had stopped at a pizza hut to uh, pick up dinner and we were waiting outside in the parking lot. It was around Christmas time and, and uh, there, were, there were Christmas carols on the radio and, and my oldest boy asked something about um, Jesus and about belief. And I told him that, uh, you know, kind of gave him a thumbnail. At, a, at that time, I still hadn't rejected the idea of hell as a, as a literal thing. So he, had, he was asking about it. I said, well, people who believe when they die, they go to this place called heaven. And in the midst of this, you know, rambling conversation, trying to explain to, to my young children, um, he, he, he interrupted and said, well, what about people who don't believe? Yeah. And I paused for a minute and I tried to present it as, as kindly as I could. But I basically said, well, they go to a place called hell. And he broke into tears. Oh. And, and I had twin um, twins at that time. They were about three years old. And in that environment, that emotional environment, they started crying. So here we are in this car, everybody's crying. And uh, it was a, it was a epiphanal moment for me because I realized that even though I, I never intended it, I was uh, imposing the same kind of thinking on my children at a, at a very early age. So that was, um, that was a pivotal moment for me. And, and I started really challenging what the, the belief system was that I was engaged in at that time and found that it was really difficult because it's not just those questions. You can't just ask them and have conversations. People get so emotionally involved and they start making uh, decisions and drawing conclusions about who we, who I am as a person if I challenge their faith. So I was quiet about it until 9-11 happened. And my wife's mother at the time had started moving more and more into her religious beliefs. And so she, at one point, it was a very emotional time, as you all remember. Um, and we were having a conversation one night at, at our place, and she said something about um, God was angry, and that's why this happened, and we needed to get right with the Lord. And I kind of blew up at her, because at that point, I, I thought, there just wasn't any evidence for it. It was just people saying something that there that wasn't true. It was too much. Uh, there was too much information out there, real world information that said that no, these things happen for for human reasons. So that was kind of my coming out, if you will. I never did declare myself an atheist till I actually moved up to to Canada. But uh, so it was a process. There wasn't, I would say, any particular moment. There's there's a handful of of uh, Experiences that I can recall looking back that seem to um, really inform my uh, path away from from religion. Well, it's it's quite an extraordinary, mm-hmm. and I think it's a brave story because you were so isolated. You came from this abusive religious family with nobody to really support you. You thought your way out of it, and frankly, Nate, I wonder if you had been in post-traumatic stress syndrome, perhaps, you know, you, it was quite, quite something to shake away from. Oh yeah. And then, yeah, that was one of the first diagnoses I got when I was in, uh, 
and therapy that I had PTSD and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was, it was an interesting experience when they, when they told me that my, my, my conclusions at, at this point is PTSD is a label that, that talks about certain symptoms, but we still have to move on. We can't hang our hat on, on, uh, you know, those diagnoses and, and, and use that as an excuse to not improve ourselves and, and, uh, and grow. So, uh, you know, there, there are a number of symptoms that, that still I experience today, uh, but I've learned how to uh, understand it better and to move my way myself out of it when I fall into one of those holes, right? So, Nate, we have about 30 seconds left. I wish we could continue here. Uh, are you in touch with any of the others who left the family or with the family at all? Well, as you know, it's, it's typical that they ostracize those who uh, leave situations like that. So none, no, no contact with those who are still involved. But um, like I said, my older brother left. Um, I have a sister who left. And I have a relationship. Well, my, my brother who left passed away a couple of years ago. But, um, so there was some contact with family, yeah. Well, uh, your story is a cautionary tale, and um, we really appreciate your sharing um, these details and also you've written about it in an issue of Free Thought Today. Someone could Google your name and Free Thought Today and, and read more about your, your story. But um, you've really raised a great deal of consciousness about that and um, so we really appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you for Thanks joining. For me. Thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.